Welcome to the Dirty Dozen online presentation brought to you by the National Recreation and Park Association and the National Playground Safety Institute. By learning about these 12 common playground hazards, you're helping to ensure the safety of all the children in your community. Note, this presentation includes an audio narration, so be sure to have your speakers or headphones ready. If for any reason you cannot listen to the audio, you may use the closed caption option by clicking the CC symbol on the presentation player. Now, let's move on to learn about the Dirty Dozen. Number one, improper protective surfacing. The surface or ground under or around the playground equipment should be soft enough to cushion a fall. Did you know that improper surfacing material under playground equipment is the leading cause of playground-related injuries? Over 79% of all accidents on playgrounds are from children falling. A fall onto hard surfaces could even be life-threatening, yet there are many surfaces that offer protection from falls. These include engineered wood fiber, wood chips, pea gravel, sand, synthetic or rubber tiles, shredded rubber, mats, and poured in place rubber. Unsafe and unacceptable playground surfaces include concrete, asphalt or blacktop, packed earth, and grass. Most loose fill surfacing must be maintained at a depth of 12 inches and be free of standing water and debris. Let's move on now to learn about number two on the Dirty Dozen checklist. Number two, inadequate use zone. A use zone is the area under and around playground equipment where a child might fall. A use zone should be covered with protective surfacing material and extend a minimum of six feet in all directions from the edge of stationary play equipment. Let's review the rules for several common types of use zones. Slide use zone. Let's examine the use zone at the bottom of the slide or the exit area. For slides six feet or less in height, the use zone at the bottom of the exit area should extend a minimum of six feet from the end of the slide. For slides between six feet and eight feet high, the use zone at the exit of the slide is equal to the height of the platform or entrance up to the slide. The maximum exit use zone, regardless of height, is eight feet. School age belt swing use zone. Swings require a much greater area for the use zone than many other aspects of the playground. The use zone should extend two times the height of the pivot or swing hanger in front of and behind the swing seats. The use zone should also extend six feet to the side of the support structure. Taut enclosed swing use zone. A fully enclosed taut swing requires less of a use zone than school age belt swings. Measure the vertical distance from the bottom of the seat to the pivot point or swing hanger and multiply by two for the use zone in front of and behind the swing. Let's move on now to learn about number three on the Dirty Dozen checklist. Number three, protrusion and entanglement hazards. A protrusion hazard is a component or piece of hardware that is capable of impaling or cutting a child if a child should fall against the hazard. Some protrusions are also capable of catching strings or items of clothing worn around a child's neck. This type of entanglement is especially hazardous because it might result in strangulation. Did you know that the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission does not recommend the use of drawstrings on children's outerwear because of the potential strangulation hazard? Examples of protrusion and entanglement hazards include bolt ends that extend more than two threads beyond the face of the nut, hardware configurations that form a hook or leave a gap or space between components, open S-type hooks, 
and rungs or handholds that protrude outward from a support structure and which may be capable of penetrating the eye socket. Also, special attention should be paid to the area at the top of slides and sliding devices. Protruding hardware and some gaps may act as a hook and catch clothing. Ropes should be anchored securely at both ends and not be capable of forming a loop or a noose. Let's move on now to learn about number four on the Dirty Dozen checklist. Number four, entrapment in openings. Enclosed openings on playground equipment must be checked for head entrapment hazards. Children often enter openings feet first and attempt to slide through the opening. If the opening is not large enough, it may allow the body to pass through the opening, but entrap the head. Generally, there should be no openings on playground equipment that measure between three and a half and nine inches. Where the lower boundary of the opening is formed by the protective surfacing, the opening is not considered to be hazardous. Pay special attention to openings at the top of a slide, openings between platforms, openings on climbers where distance between rungs might be less than nine inches, partially bounded openings such as seen at the top of a picket fence. Let's move on to learn about number five on the Dirty Dozen checklist. Number five, insufficient equipment spacing. Improper spacing between pieces of play equipment can cause overcrowding of a play area, resulting in unsafe play conditions. Each item of play equipment has a use zone around it where protective surfacing material is applied. These use zones may overlap for certain types of equipment. Equipment less than 30 inches in height may overlap use zones with 6 feet in between. Equipment higher than 30 inches must have 9 feet in between each structure. The two fro area of swings, the exit area of slides, standing rocking equipment, and merry-go-rounds may not overlap use zones. This provides room for children to circulate and prevents the possibility of a child falling off of one structure and striking another. Swings and merry-go-rounds should be located near the boundary of the playground. Let's move on now to learn about number six on the Dirty Dozen checklist. Number six. Trip hazards. Trip hazards are created by play structure components or items on the playground. Common trip hazards often found in play environments include exposed concrete footings, abrupt changes in surface elevations, tree roots, tree stumps, and rocks. If you ever feel that there are trip hazards on a playground you use, you may simply be able to remove them yourself, as in rocks or loose debris, or alert someone to have them removed or repaired. Let's move on now to learn about number seven on the Dirty Dozen checklist. Number seven, lack of supervision. The supervision of a playground environment directly relates to the overall safety of the environment. Did you know that it is estimated that over 40% of all playground injuries are directly related to improper use of equipment combined with lack of supervision? A play area should be designed so that it's easy for a parent or caregiver to observe the children at play. Young children are constantly challenging their own abilities, often not being able to recognize potential hazards. Parents and caregivers must supervise their children at all times on the playground. Let's move on now to learn about number eight on the Dirty Dozen checklist. Number eight, age inappropriate activities. Children's developmental needs vary greatly from age two to age 12. In an effort to provide a challenging and safe play environment for all ages, it is important to make sure that the equipment in the playground setting is appropriate for the age of the intended user. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission does not recommend the following for preschool users. Freestanding arch climbers, freestanding flexible climbers, chain and cable walks, fulcrum seesaws, log rolls, track rides, or vertical sliding poles. 
Did you know that it is recommended that areas for preschool age children be separate from areas intended for school age children? Let's move on now to learn about number nine on the Dirty Dozen checklist. Number nine, lack of maintenance. In order for playgrounds to remain in safe condition, a program of systematic preventative maintenance must be present. There should be no missing, broken, or worn out components. All hardware should be secure. The wood, metal, or plastic should not show signs of fatigue or deterioration. All parts should be stable with no apparent signs of loosening. Surfacing material must be maintained. And check for signs of vandalism. Let's move on now to learn about number 10 on the Dirty Dozen checklist. Number 10, sharp edge, crush, and shearing hazards. Sharp edge hazards. Components in the play environment should be inspected to make sure there are no sharp edges or points that could penetrate skin. This presents an obvious hazard which must be removed before children may use the equipment. Crush or shearing hazards. Moving components such as suspension bridges, track rides, merry-go-rounds, seesaws, and swings should be checked to ensure there are no moving parts or mechanisms that might crush or shear a child's finger or other body part. Obviously, wear and tear can cause an existing playground to develop one of these types of hazards, even if it was previously safe. This is why regular maintenance and inspections are very important. Let's move on now to learn about number 11 on the Dirty Dozen checklist. Number 11, platforms with no guardrails. Elevated surfaces such as platforms, ramps, and bridges should have guardrails or barriers to help prevent accidental falls. Preschool age children are more at risk for falls. Therefore, equipment intended for this age group should have guardrails on elevated platforms higher than 20 inches, protective barriers on platforms higher than 30 inches. Equipment intended for school age children should have guardrails on elevated platforms higher than 30 inches, and protective barriers on platforms above 48 inches. Let's move on now to learn about number 12 on the Dirty Dozen checklist. Number 12, equipment not recommended for public playgrounds. Accidents associated with the following types of equipment have resulted in the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission recommending that they not be used on public playgrounds. These include heavy swings such as animal figure swings, multiple occupancy or glider type swings, free swinging ropes which may fray or form a loop, and swinging exercise rings and trapeze bars. However, you may want to know that overhead hanging rings that have a short chain of seven inches are allowed on public playground equipment. Let's move on now to view a slide which sums up all 12 items on the Dirty Dozen checklist for your review. Then, you may want to visit the NRPA website www.nrpa.org, where you may obtain the hard copy Dirty Dozen pamphlet. Thank you for taking the time to educate yourself about playground safety. We at NRPA understand the effort that excellent child supervision requires, and we appreciate and applaud your efforts.